Foundation Physiotherapy at Georgetown Honda present Out of the Park with Barry Davis. This week, former Blue Jay Ernie Witt tells us where he kept his cheat notes when he was a player. Uh, right between my ears. <laughs> well, what do you know? And now, here's a guy that is the absolute best sportscaster. In- wait, wait a minute. I didn't. I didn't write. Barry, stop messing with my cheat notes. Here's Barry Davis. Ah, yes. The cheat notes, Tom. You see, you're supposed to know this stuff about me inside your head already, right? I know, I know. And, but and by the way, when I saw those cheat notes that you had, I had no idea those were yours. I thought it was just some random piece of paper that could have been mine. So I brought it home and I passed it to my wife. I said, here, take a look at this, but don't tell anyone and don't give it back to Tom. So you're not getting it back again. But welcome to the program, <laughs> folks. There is Tom Forth. I'm Barry Davis. And of course, we are going to talk about... Uh, what are we calling it? Paper gate, uh, note gate, whatever gate it is. But this is a topic of conversation, so we will discuss this with our guest, longtime Toronto Blue Jay catcher, a day oneer, Thomas. Ernie mm-hmm. Witt will join us. And of course, we will talk about Ernie and his career with the Blue Jays, but we're going to get his take on the 2021 team and a lot of the craziness that has gone on lately. Yeah, some some fantastic insights. And you know what he says about the whole Kiermeyer gate as well is is awesome. It's can't miss. Oh, okay. Kiermeyer gate. Yeah, I could have <laughs> known that. Up next, uh, we will talk a little Kiermeyer gate as well as uh well, another couple of votes now into the robot umpires. We'll explain next. There's Tom Forth, I'm Barry Davis. You're listening to and watching Out of the Park. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, the first pitch with Barry Davis. And the first pitch is brought to you by Georgetown Honda. It is 316 Guelph Street in Georgetown, Ontario. And you can see me there. Tom, you can not only come in and look for a car, but just sit down and, and, and shoot the shit. We can talk a little baseball. Bask in baseball with Barry. Yes. Here's the thing. Uh, we've talked about this for the last few weeks. There is a shortage on vehicles. And you drive through any car lot anywhere, you're going to see how empty it is. We are very fortunate in the fact that we've just gotten in a couple of ridge lines. Now, ridge lines are the Honda pickup trucks. And these things are phenomenal, high demand. We only have a couple. We also have one that's just come off a demo. Uh, it was uh, belonged to one of our sales managers. So it's got like 14,000 kilometers on it, 2021. It's a black, beautiful ridgeline. Come check us out, and uh, I'll help you drive home in one. How about that, Tom? There we go. Sounds like a good deal. Okay. I got out <laughs> that. I got my little plug out of the way. And now let's talk about some baseball, and, and we'll get into uh, Kiermaier Gate in a second. But mm-hmm. first of all, I know that Blue Jays fans have had this – reputation as being uh, concerned about a conspiracy against them. Mm -hmm. Very worried that when things do not go well for their teams, it is because the league, whether it be the NHL, NBA, Major League Baseball, the league does not want a Canadian team to go far. Mm -hmm. And as much as I poo-poo that, and I constantly do, and I still do, when I see things like we saw this past week, when the Blue Jays were getting robbed, and I mean absolutely robbed in the strike zone it makes me wonder if there may not be some conspiracy theory out there (laughs) it's hard to understand i mean that i know the game that really tipped it off you know joe west was terrible in in the finale of the tampa series but it was the game before that i i even forget the ron culpa culpa he cost us two runs two runs in an inning he cost three at bats like their Bichette should have walked, Hernandez should have walked. That's two runs right there. Tied ball game. Um, even like the ump scorecard that uh, the, the that site I follow on Twitter, we lost three and a half runs in the final two games of that series due to umpiring. Yeah. And and I mean that's just on missed calls that cost us runs that we should have gotten. As a fan, how can you not be angry? Like I understand a missed call here and a missed call there, but that ninth inning in the second game of the series against Tampa was a train wreck each at bat had one that 
you know, made in the shade should have been a ball called a strike. Changed the complexion of the at bat. You know, with Bichette, it gave him an extra pitch. He should have gone four and zero when he was on base, right? And gave him that extra pitch, and he ended up popping out. And you know, the same same can be said. Like how many at bats in that inning were changed dramatically by just terrible strike calls. So I don't know if the, you know, we obviously can't ask the ump if he threw the game, but wouldn't it be great if we could ask him, man, what were you thinking? Like, see, that will never happen because umpires do not be need to be held accountable. They're yeah. not expected to address the media after a bad game and, and explain why they made the bad calls. And I've, I've had folks say to me, well, as long as the strike zone was consistent, then I'm okay with it. Well, not if the strike zone is consistently bad, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I understand if you're going to give a corner or maybe, you know, you've got the inside pitch that might be a little in, but he's calling it that way all. These weren't even close. These were yep. not, like, on the edge, and maybe this sump gives it and this doesn't. These were just horrific calls. No doubt mm -hmm. about it. There's nothing that you can say that's going to make me change my mind on that. And you're right. Culpa was even worse than Joe West. Yeah, and he and and you know what they they were talking about it throughout the game that that inconsistent strike zone. But then if you looked at his actual, you know, results for the first eight innings of the game, he was actually relatively consistent and relatively in the zone in terms of his calls. But in the ninth inning with the Blue Jays at bat, he just threw it out the window. And you know that's a great thing about having all these analytics is you know we felt like we were kind of getting shafted before as Blue Jays fans in the '80s and '90s. I remember that feeling, that palpable feeling. Triple um, play, the triple yep, play that was the triple play is the perfect example, right? But now we can actually look, and, and they're tracking it now, so we can we can look and and then see those runs. It you know what the thing is though, it doesn't make us feel any better about it, does it? No. <laughs> and, and, and I don't think anybody feels any better about what happened at the Trop as well, where Kevin Kiermeyer, as we have seen a million times, and we'll see later on the show when we talk to Ernie Witt about it, uh, picked up Alejandro Kirk's cheat sheet that had fallen out of his pants when they made a play at home plate. Now, I, I tell you, Tom, I have seesawed back and forth on how I feel about this, and do I think that that was pretty slimy of Kiermaier to do, or it's just part of the game, or Kiermaier should have, or Kirk should have had that more secure. Or, and we'll get into Kirk's part of it and what he should or should not have do. Mm -hmm. We'll get into that when we talk to Ernie, because Ernie's a catcher. My talk here with you is whether or not we feel Kiermaier did a bad thing, and if Ryan Barucki also did a bad thing. And me personally... I finally come to the realization that neither one of them did anything wrong. <laughs> uh, I'm right with you on Kiermaier all along. Um, Kiermaier, I mean, listen, why do, why do baseball teams have signs in the first place, right? Why do they go through, like, how much time and effort is spent hiding signs, developing signs, trying to trick the other team? Because you expect the other team to be looking for that competitive advantage. Stealing a sign isn't expressly against the rules. If you're dumb enough to put your sign on a card and throw it on the ground, I love the Jays. I can't stand Kiermaier. Ever since, you know, we always felt that Pilar should have been getting those gold gloves and Kiermaier sneak. And he's one of those snaky players that always gives the Jays trouble, has for years. I'm not a fan, but I see nothing wrong with what he did. If it's going to fall out, if you need those cards, buyer beware, right? Here's the only thing that I do not appreciate about this whole thing on the Kiermaier side, and that is he lied. Just admit it. Yeah, I knew it was their cheat sheet. And damn right I'm taking it, and damn right I'm not yep. giving it back. I mean, yep. I'm sorry. That's it's just part of the game. If you're going to, like you said, if you're going to have a cheat sheet, don't make it accessible because that's what teams are constantly trying to do. As long as there's nothing electronic going on, then Kiermaier didn't break a rule. I'm sorry. I, I know that a lot of Blue Jays fans are, are not going to like that opinion that mm -hmm. we have. Now, likewise, Ryan Barucki uh, I got another, yeah. Kevin Kiermaier mm -hmm. did the right thing because whether or not it was ethically wrong or not, th he did something, Kiermaier, to upset the Blue Jays, and the Blue Jays needed someone to let him know, you don't screw around with us. My applause to Ryan Barucki for throwing the ball at him. 
I, I definitely agree. Ten years ago, twenty years ago. Oh, go um, below the twenty years ago. Same I, I definitely. Yeah, I definitely. Well, it is, but like ten years ago, twenty years ago, you would have done that to make a statement that would have galvanized the team, that would have made them like you know just given them that extra push, that extra incentive going into, and. Tom, I mean, we're 20, as we're recording 50, this 2016 or 2015, 2015. Do you not recall Aaron Sanchez, Kansas City Royals, David Price's first game, that whole fight and the pitch from Sanchez and Donaldson getting hit? And what did that do? It galvanized the Blue Jays and it brought them. Mm. But the game is different now than it was in 2016. <laughs> and. That and is sad, isn't it? And, and it may not even, yeah, but it may not even necessarily be the players. It may be the media. Because how did this play out in the media? This hasn't been a feel good story. The Jays didn't bounce out, you know, bounce out of the gate from Tampa. All systems go, galvanized as a team. We're struggling. Oh, yeah. And so this didn't have the effect that it wanted in the media. It seems to have really taken a little bit of that, you know, that, that good vibe out of this great run that we've been having. And, and you know what it, it, Tom, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. It, and, it, and it baffles me because, like, what Pete Walker did was exactly the right thing. And it's something Charlie Montoyo should have done a long time ago. But you can't force someone to, do, to be something he's not, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Cito Gaston might be the best example of someone who could do that. Cito was just so calm and just, you know, real chill. But when he needed to come out and defend his team... He would howl his ass out on the field, get right into the umpire's face. And this is something that Charlie Montoyo, as a manager, needs to learn how to do. And if he can't, you know, he's not a coach, per se. He's not teaching these guys how to play baseball. He is leading this team. And he has to have their backs when shit like this happens. He needed to go out there, and he needed to go right in the umpire's face. And time and time again, he doesn't. So now Pete Walker steps up. Congratulations mm -hmm. to Pete Walker. To me, that was the best move of the three by showing that, you know, he's not going to sit down and watch this happen. Yeah, you know what? It, that is, you're right. In terms of passion, we needed that. We needed that big time. Um, because, yeah, the, you know, the, the hit by pitch didn't seem to really rally it. You know, maybe that is something feel good, just that display of passion. You're right about Montoya, but you know what? Does every manager have to be barreling out there? Like, does, is that what time. makes them? No. When it's needed. When it's needed. Right? Mm -hmm. Listen, you're the father of two sons. If somebody harmed one of your sons or did something to, to you know, do something bad to one of your sons, you're not going to just sit there and go, oh, it's okay. It's okay. No, you're going to get out there and go, what the hell are you doing to my kid? Well, yeah, but the thing is, I'm not the only parent in my house. Just like... Charlie Montoyo has Pete Walker to do some of the yelling. Yeah, right? nah, nah, don't go there because you and your wife, Robin, are supposed to be even. We know that she's way above you. Right? I'm not even with she's, her. She's, she's she's way above. She's the manager and you're the bench coach, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I do the barking. Yes, you do. All right, listen, uh, speaking of passion, we're going to continue that passion in a moment as uh, we speak to one of the most popular Blue Jays in franchise history. The first Blue Jay that I can ever remember having his name chanted at home games. Ernie Witt joins us next. There's Tom Forth. I'm Barry Davis. You're listening to and watching Out of the Park. Whoa! Oh, it is so good. Grand Slam. I wouldn't believe it. Jays have turned this game upside down. Ernie Witt has Grand Slam the Red Sox. Well, joining us back here on Out of the Park, a good friend of the show, Mr. Ernie Witt, one of the original Toronto Blue Jays. And Ernie, man, there is just so much to talk about with this Toronto Blue Jays team. First of all, have you been following the Jays in 2021 at all? Absolutely. They're, to me, they're a very exciting team. I, I think they've really, uh, they have grown uh, with the young kids and they filtered in with some veteran players. Uh, they're an exciting team to watch. I mean, they, they hit, they steal bases, they pitch. Uh, you know, they've got a closer at the end. And, and to me, it's, it's a great opportunity for them. Ernie, I, I've talked to a lot of players who played in your era and, you know, sometimes the guys in the 80s and 90s. And I always love to get their opinion on what they think when they see a catcher or an outfielder reach into their pocket and pick up their cheat notes in between batters. Because 
I never saw you do that. So my question is, where did you keep your notes on all the hitters? Uh, right between my ears. <laughs> well, what do you know? Isn't what that something? Uh, it, it's it's. Um, I know that we're doing it in the big leagues with the Phillies right now. Uh, we have not gone to that in the minor league system yet. I, I just, I'm a firm believer that our catchers should know what our pitchers are capable of doing. I also feel that our, our catchers should know what the opposing hitters are doing. I mean, unless you're facing them for the first time, but that's why you have advanced meetings. And to me, it's their responsibility to, uh, to do all of that and to be a part and engaged in it. And they, they need to focus on part of their game and that's learning it. It really has created a bit of a brouhaha here at the end of the season. And, uh, you know, we had the incident with Kier Meyer, and now it seems to be something that, you know, is kind of proving a distraction. I'd love to know what your take is on it, though. So Kier Meyer, you know, bending down and picking up that uh, picking up that card. Is that is that a no go? Is that something that he shouldn't have done? Or is that something that, you know, the Blue Jays just have to be more careful with their proprietary information? Well, I think it's a responsibility of the team that are u- utilizing those notes. And uh, I-, I really don't think anything wrong with it. You know, you're, you're picking up litter the way I look at it. You know, there's a piece of paper on the ground. I thought he was being a good citizen, but believe me, <laughs> trying to take advantage of the opposing team that has been going on for a number of years, a number of years. And, and it, it will continue to go on. Uh, you just have to be a little bit more secure on giving your signs, uh, taking care of your business. If you're using notes and not allowing the other team to take advantage of that. Has it gotten to the point where, you know, catchers and pitchers are, are just so inundated with information because there's so many analytics out there, you know, every batter has got a, a hitting chart that, you know, the catcher's got to know. Is, is this that, you know, teams aren't doing a good enough job at getting their catchers and pitchers prepared so they need the cheat notes? Or is it just that we're throwing so much information at them now that it's impossible to keep up? We're throwing a lot of information out there. But the bottom line, I mean, just to make things as simple as possible, you have a heat map for the hitters. You have a heat map for your pitchers where they're capable of executing their pitches. And to me, I've always been a a, a strong advocate of knowing what is best for your pitchers and not taking them out of that. So if we have a pitcher that can command the lower outside part of a plate to a right-handed hitter, Anything, it comes crunch time, you're going to go to that spot. And to me, it's all about execution. Right now, we've got a lot of pitchers in the big leagues, in the minor leagues, that all they're thinking about is velocity. They're just rearing back and trying to throw as hard as they can. And that's something where I think we have fallen a little short of, is teaching our, our pitchers how to pitch, how to execute pitches. And I think that's the most important thing. So I would agree that, you know, Kiermaier picking up, it's just, it's part of the game. He picks up the card and whether he thought it was the Blue Jays card or not, I don't, I don't think there's any relevance there. He picks it up. Good for him. But on the other side of the coin, Ernie, I also think there was nothing wrong with Ryan Barucki throwing at him because to me, you've got to defend your team. And whether you believe he did the right thing or the wrong thing, I, I gave a lot of props to Barucki because you got to defend your team. And as, first of all, did, did you agree with him throwing at Kiermaier? And B, there must have been some really great stories of when you squat behind the plate, look down at your your pitcher and said, we're throwing at this guy. Uh, you know, again, I don't know whether he threw it, uh, Scott, for that reason or, or whether ball got away from him. Of course, they're probably going to say he got away from him, but behind closed doors, he's saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm protecting our team. Uh, but again, there's ways to go about it. I didn't see the play yet. I haven't seen the play yet. Uh, wh- whether it was a, you know, as long as it was hit and he was thrown at in his body area, that's yeah, in the fine. back. Yeah, all the back. You know, anything up above the shoulders, I I do not tolerate. I do not accept. Uh, but there's ways to get your message across, and I mean that just goes back to, you know, basically I hate to say this, but old school baseball. I mean it. It's like. Hey, we felt you did something wrong. We're, we're going to, you know, do it. If you're trying to steal our signs and we catch it, we're going to retaliate. And we'll do it in a way where, you know, we send a message, 
not purposely trying to hurt the guy or, or damage his career, but knowing that we're not pushovers. And I'm, I'm thinking, thinking that, that at, at least, least back, back in your day, day, when the hitter came up and you guys were going to throw at him, he knew that you, they were going to throw at him, right? He knew he's done something to deserve it, so they're almost preparing for it. Absolutely. I mean, you, you know when you do something wrong against the other team, and you know that, you know, if you back in the 80s, if you pimp the home run, it's a good chance that either the next hitter is going to be thrown at or they're going to get you the next time up. But again, there, that was just we, that was just us policing our own game. And uh, it's not acceptable now in this in this day and age. But back in the before the the 80s and the 80s and, and past, uh, I mean, before that, it was acceptable. We've talked to a lot of pitchers that have some fantastic stories about plunking various batters. As a catcher, did you ever call for a pitcher to plunk a batter? No, come on. How am I supposed to answer that? <laughs> I think okay. you're safe now. I don't think they can suspend you anymore. <laughs> you never know. Uh, of course, you know, of course, there's there's a lot of things that happen. You know, I was fortunate to play in three decades, 70s, 80s, and a little part of the 90s. Uh, so, yes, I, I've seen that. Yes, we have done that. Uh, but, again, it's always been for a good cause. What we felt, we were policing the game. We, we didn't want the other team to try to take advantage of us. and Or we were protecting one of our own players. I, I like what you said about where you hit a hitter. And I think a lot of young pitchers today don't know how to throw at a batter. Because I've seen it before where they're, they're throwing at the head, they're throwing behind, they're throwing over the head. And I'm thinking, you know, I remember back in that if Dave Steve needed to hit somebody, he knew where to hit him. He'd do it with the first pitch. And if he missed, then you move on and say, I, I blew my chance to get him back. Right? That, that, that's true, Barry. I mean, it, it's, it's very simple. I mean, we have these uh, plastic dummies now that our pitchers put up to uh, emulate hitters in the batter's box. I mean, that's a perfect time to practice that. I mean, you, you hit, you hit the dummy in the, in the, the rear end and there's no hurt, no, no harm, no foul, but yet it's a teaching moment for them too, where they need to execute that pitch. So we've been talking about plunking batters for a long time, but let's, let's kind of go back to where the conversation started and with, with these 2021 Blue Jays. Um, we had Jesse Barfield on last week and, you know, it was a conversation that was sort of full of just excited praise for this team. And, um, you know, we talked about it briefly at the at the start, you know, they're they're hitting the cover off the ball, but they also seem to be doing all the really small things right. So with what you've seen of this team, you know, we're right now as we're recording this it's been a bit of a shaky week for the for the Jays but we're we're raring to the end of the season how are you feeling about the Jays how do you like the team and what do you think their postseason chances are if they're going to make it why and if they're not maybe why not well I don't think it's going to be an easy road for them to make it I mean they're battling the Yankees uh in Boston trying to get that uh that card or especially the Yankees uh, and but they have a series with them, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So this weekend, I believe the Yankees and Red Sox are playing each other. So I mean, that could be back and forth if one team sweeps the other one. You know, I'm sure that uh, the Blue Jays are hoping for maybe Boston to sweep New York, which would give them a little bit of a break because right now I believe uh, the Blue Jays are one game behind, if I'm not mistaken, in, in the wild card, that second play in team. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to be tough, but I think the bottom line is if they execute, as in most games, if you execute, you make the pitches when you have to make them, you, ex, you know, you put down the sacrifice point if that's the case, you know, score the runner from, from third base, you advance the runner from second base with less than two outs. If you do all those little things, it usually adds up to a pretty good chance of winning the game. Ernie, you've had the opportunity to play with you know playoff teams and you've had the opportunity to play with teams that well was well, stunk they, they didn't have a chance to make the postseason as you're going into a september game you're on your way driving to exhibition stadium in you know 1980 compared to driving to a game in 1985 uh, what's the different feeling in september when you know you're going to the ballpark and it's on, baby. We're, we're, we're running for postseason as opposed to, 
well, maybe we can be the spoiler today. Well, it, it, there is a big difference. And again, if you're playing a, a, against a team like in the early 80s, uh, where we were building, uh, and that team was a contender, there was more excitement on our part. If we're playing against a team that was basically spinning their wheels like we were back then, um, you know, that it's just, okay, let's go put in our, you know, three and a half, four hours and then and, and go back to the house. Uh, playing when there's something on the line is exciting. You can't wait to get to the ballpark. You can't wait to put on that uniform and you can't wait for the game to start. That's the biggest difference to me. And, and I mean, you're as a professional athlete, you're supposed to be prepared for every game that you play. But there is a difference when you're in the hunt and you're playing for something on the line. Because again, that's that's what professional athletes do. They want to reach that pinnacle of winning a World Series. You know, the Jays had a, a magnificent run, especially during sort of the end of your time there from 85 to 89. Uh, is there one team that sticks out in your mind as you know, none of those teams made it all the way, but is there one team that sticks out in your mind that should have, or that had all the tools to have done it? Yeah. I mean, I, let, be honest with you, the 85 team, I, I was excited because we, in 84, I thought we had a pretty good team, but we really didn't have a closer. Uh, we, we competed the 85 team, you know, after so many years of losing, that was exciting for us. I still remember seeing George Bell catch that final ball against the Yankees and for us to clinch that, uh, the, the division, uh, the disappointing part is we had a three, three, one lead on Kansas city and they came back and, and beat us. I mean, so that was disappointing. I do believe the best team I ever played on was the 87 team. And unfortunately we didn't make the playoffs. You know, we, we lost our final seven games, um, which was absolutely crushing. Uh, but I think overall that was probably our best team that we had 89, you know, it was a good season. You know, we had a change of manager, I believe that year. Um, uh, Cito came in and picked, uh, picked up, uh, Jimmy Williams. Jimmy, yeah. Uh, but that, that was fun, but we played against the team in, in the playoffs, the Oakland A's at, uh, they were built to win. And, uh, you know, they, 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 Kind of out, lay out. You know, it's funny that fans tend to let things linger on a long time, right? The Blue Jays lose a game. The fans are going to go to bed upset. They're going to wake up upset. For a player, though, you can't afford to do that, right? I mean, how quickly can you put that terrible loss behind you? Is it as you're you know once you get out of the shower is it on your drive home do you like are there games that were harder to let go the hardest games to let go are the ones that are really necessary games to win and you lose it in the last inning or so those are the ones that you just relive relive everything about it every pitch sequence that you put down for the pitcher whether the pitcher executed or not those are the toughest ones to to let go but again, in baseball, there's usually a game the next day. I mean, which is, which is a good thing in most cases until you get to the playoffs, of course. But, and that's, that's what, you know, I have always tried to talk to our, our younger players is that you're going to have good games and you're going to have bad games. And the quicker you can get rid of your bad games and forget about it and move on to the next day or the next game, the better off you're going to be and the better ball player you're going to be. So Barry talks about fans getting over these losses in a certain amount of time. I still remember I was nine years old in 87 and I still get a little bit angry when I think of Doyle Alexander. He was the one that my nine year old blame brain blamed for that 87 collapse, right? It just <laughs> seemed like he had our number that year. Is there, is there a loss in your career that still sticks with you? Like that comes right to the forefront even now? Come and on, I'm thinking you, every time he thinks of Jim Sunberg, he probably has bad nightmares. <laughs> well, there, there's no question. That was a, a ball that I thought was just a routine fly ball to right field. And, and for some reason, it carried out of the ballpark. Uh, you know, I think our pitcher executed a decent pitch. He got him. But anytime a hitter that can go opposite field and hits it out of the ballpark on a, on a, a pretty decent pitch, you just 
you know, you, you tip your hat to them and you go, well, maybe it was just meant to be. I mean, then you, you turn around and that Kansas City team goes and they're down three to one against St. Louis. They come back and beat St. Louis to win the, you know, the world championship. So, uh, again, sometimes it's, I, I'm not a true believer in it, but I think destiny sometimes comes into play and it was destined for the Royals to win it that year in 85. And, you know, Doyle, he, he was a teammate of mine for, for a few years. And he was probably one of the easiest pitchers for me to catch because I was like catching in a rocking chair with him because he, he executed his pitches. He hit his spots and he changed speeds and he was, he was just a true pitcher, not a thrower. We have spoken to a number of catchers who caught Roy Halladay, and one of the things they all seemed to say was that Doc didn't like guys going out to the mound to talk to him unless he called them out. He had specific things that he needed the catchers to do, and there were some young catchers that might have been a little intimidated by him. Did you ever have a pitcher in your career that you caught that kind of said, listen, I know you're, you're a catcher, I know you got a job to do, but just leave me alone. If I need you, I'll call you. Uh, did you ever have an, an experience like that? Not really. Um, you know, again, I think the rapport that I had with our pitching staff and I think uh, Buck Martinez had the same thing when we were working together is that they they relied on us to do our homework and know the hitters and know them and what they're capable of doing, what's working for them at that point in time, whether, uh, you know, the, the, the guy's slider is really on that night. We recognize it right away. And so we might utilize a little bit more than we normally would. But uh, not really, because again, you you always uh, I've always been taught that the catcher will do anything we can to help the pitcher out, whatever that takes. And I, I still teach that to our kids today. Is like your your first priority is is dealing with the pitching staff and making sure that they're comfortable with how you're handling the game, how you're receiving the ball, how you're blocking the ball, how you're calling the game. All that comes into play when. We hear about the camaraderie of this Toronto Blue Jays team. It, it ends up being something that has really galvanized this group together. I want to go back to 1977 for a moment because you're selected by the Blue Jays from the Red Sox in the expansion draft. And there you go, joining this this team, you know, that it's it's everybody's new to each other. Like, nobody knows anybody. What do you recall about that first time you walk in the clubhouse and it's just like, all right, here's a group of players that maybe a couple of them have played together. Maybe they know each other. Like, maybe they don't. Do you remember what that was like? Yeah, I, I actually do. And I remember our, our president at that time coming in, our first one of our first meetings in, in Dunedin, Florida. Uh, Peter Bravesi came in and he said, gentlemen, you guys are just a sizzle of the steak to come. And that just has <laughs> stuck in my mind all these years. And I kept thinking in the early part of the eighties, I says, when is, when is this steak going to be done? You know, it, cause I'm tired of sizzling, but uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's whenever you bring a group of guys in baseball players, and I'm sure it's the same with hockey, basketball players, there's a bond that you create. And in most cases I, I have not been on a team where there's been a separation. It's always been, you know, you're taking care of your teammates and you're working together. Uh, so I've heard of rumors. I've heard of where the Yankees, they had 25 different cabs come and pick them up and they all went their separate way. I can say that that's never happened on any team that I played with. And I'll even take it a step farther. I've been fortunate enough to manage Baseball Canada with the national team. And it, the one thing that we've always had, and I think that's helped us be successful through the years, is that the camaraderie, that the players come together, and they're not playing for the name on the back, they're playing for the name on the front of their jersey, and that's the country. And that's what we, we try to do in professional ball. It doesn't always work, but I think in the instance with the Team Canada, it has worked. Is it something getting that, you know, getting that team to gel like that on a social level or, or you know, is it something that helps the teams play, um, you know, when they're hitting those bumps in the road and things like that? Or is it is it something that can be kind of ruined by those bumps in the road? Well, again, that's where you come up with your your kind of your veteran players, guys that have been through it before. 
those are the ones that really have to step to the forefront and ex explain to the kids that, you know, hey, we've, we've gone through this before, you know, it will pass, we'll just work through it. So you have to have enough of those guys to in intermingle with your younger players so that they understand that it's not always going to be smooth rides. You know, there will be some bumps in the road. And the quicker you get over those bumps and move on to the next one, then the better your team's going to be and the better you're going to be as an individual playing the game. How big a part does humor in a clubhouse play? <laughs> you have to have a jokester every now and then. I mean, you, you, you've got to lighten the load, lighten the mood in the clubhouse, especially if you're going through those hurdles and you're on uh, you know, peaks and valleys and, and you're low in that valley. So, yeah, you have to have someone that lightens it up. And, uh, you know, it could be, you know, it, it could be a different guy every night, you know, so doing something different just just to ease the, the, the tension a little bit. And, uh, you know, I mean, every team I've played on, there's there's one or two guys that will do something just out of the ordinary, just strange. And you just look at them and just laugh. And it's like, you know, this, this is pretty cool. <laughs> I love that you say that every team that you played on had one or two guys like that, because as we were discussing, we talked with Jesse Barfield last week <laughs> and, and Jesse told us that you were that guy. <laughs> Jesse wasn't supposed to say that. I was never <laughs> that guy. I never owned up to anything. That's, that's what he said. He said, you'd walk into the room, you'd drop a comment that got them all jawing at each other and you, you just walk out. <laughs> you know, he, I, I, I won't, I'm not going to accept that. That's not true. <laughs> I would never do anything like that. You know, and I love hearing from people that knew George Bell from the inside of his circle, as opposed to what we saw on the outside of the circle. So tell us a little something about George Bell that, you know, many of us would go, really? Because as I got to know George later in, you know, later on after he finished playing, it's like, this guy is actually a really decent human being. Same with Tony. I was shocked that Tony Fernandez had such a great personality. What a funny guy Tony was. Are there a lot of guys out there that what you see in the clubhouse or what you see as you know this person personally is so different than how they're perceived in the public? I mean, there's a lot of the guys that just want to be by themselves once they leave the ballpark. But when they're at the ballpark, I mean, they're, they're just great guys. And as you mentioned, George Bell, he was probably one of my favorite teammates. And the bottom line is all he wanted to do was win. He would do anything he could to win. And he would except DH. Except DH. Well, he didn't like the DH, but he also <laughs> hit three home runs that day, too, didn't he? Just to <laughs> make a point. <laughs> but he, he is uh you know, it, it's he, he was a tremendous teammate. He wanted to win. I, I was very fortunate to play with a group of guys that uh, we all got along. I mean, you, you're going to have your little, little blow ups every now and then we're playing 162 games a year. I mean, that's you're you're constantly with them, traveling with them in the locker room with them through good and bad. There's going to be, there's going to be little, little tension at times, but again, it passes, you work it out and it, it, it works. As long as everyone's bottom line is to win, do what it takes to win. Everything is forgiven and forgotten. Ernie, in a minute, we're going to invite in uh, a few of our viewers that uh, would like to ask you a couple of questions. And uh, before I do, you know, we, we talked about uh, the player's perspective uh, and getting over things and realizing that, okay, it's a new game, it's a new day. As When you were a manager, whether it be with the Jays or Team Canada, is that different? Uh, because you've got to really take a lot more from what happened when things go bad and find a way to turn it into something good or if something's going well you've got to really figure out what it was that went, went well so you can take it to the next day was it harder to leave things behind as a manager than it is as a player absolutely because you keep you're very every time that you make a decision and it doesn't work out right you have nightmares about it the night after you know like what if i what if i didn't do this what if i did this instead of that uh and sometimes any time that you make a decision it could be the right decision but it doesn't work out the focus goes to the manager well why did he do that and that's one of the reasons i think the beauty of baseball is you can do everything right but people don't always agree with you 
And then they start talking. There's that conversation over coffee in the morning. Well, did you see the Jays game? Why did Witt do this? And why did he do that? I mean, there's always conversation and, and it, it's, it's not a perfect game. There there's, that's why you see some pitcher throwing a perfect game. It doesn't happen all the time. It's not a perfect game and players have to execute. You make the decisions. I've always had a philosophy when I managed, you guys go out and play for the first seven innings after the seventh inning, then it falls on my shoulders, whether we have to be creative to, you know, get a run, whether I have to bunt, whether we hit and run, you know, you have the, uh, the pulse of the game you have as a manager, let them play for seven innings, eighth inning on, I've, I've got the feel or the, the, the pulse of the game, then I can go and do my thing. As, as a hitter, um, you're talking about execution. Confidence is something that, you know, most hitters talk about when they're when they're in a hot streak. They, they know they're going to get that hit as the pitch is coming in or even before they step up to the plate. Um, is it that same way for managers? Do you, do you um, get confidence from the good decisions and does that seem to get you on a roll? I've always tried to put players in a position where they're going to be successful. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do, but as, as a manager, you're constantly observing. You might see something in batting practice, you know, before the game going on, whether you, you really like this guy's swing going, he might be, a, you know, the first guy off the bench that I'm going to utilize in a, in a game, you know, game winning situation because of what I saw earlier or what I've seen the you know, day or two days beforehand, he's really swinging a bat. Well, this is a guy I want up in a certain situation. So yeah, you, 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 you look at that and you try to make decisions off of your personnel that you have. All right. Let's bring in our studio audience now, Ernie. And uh, this is uh, our favorite part of the show because it gives them a chance to uh, you know, inter interact and engage with you. And uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, always nice people. Okay. Uh, Fiona, let's begin with you. Fiona, say hello to uh, Ernie. Hi, Ernie. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm just wondering, right now the Jays have three catchers on the roster. And when we get to the postseason, do you think that we're going to keep all three catchers or will one of those positions be used somewhere else? Uh, again, that's that's something Charlie's in, in the front office is going to have to decide. Uh, they've been going with three catchers, but I don't know whether it's because of the extension of the, the two men extra that added in September. Uh, if they feel that they need another arm in the bullpen, uh, then they, they might make that decision to take away one of the catchers. And I know your follow up question to that will probably go which catcher right? <laughs> i've been through this before a few times uh, that, that's a good question i don't know whether they want to go right left they want to go defensively then jansen will probably be your guy um kirk if they want to go offensively it might be kirk but even though he's he's struggled here the last week i think the swinging a bat so, i mean so again those are decisions that the manager in the front office and the coaching staff take into play I mean, those first couple of years in Toronto, I mean, you know, Phil Root was there and Rick Cerrone was there. Uh, when you're a young catcher, do you do you kind of become friends with these guys and realize that you can learn from them? Or are you guys all thinking, well, I need to play? Well, no, I need to play. Uh, how do you balance that? Uh, usually the guy that's swinging a hot bat or on a winning streak handling the pitching staff is the guy that is selected to play. And that's, that's done by the manager. If you have a good manager, you know, like in the, in the 70s, the 70s, when I was there, not there, we had a manager by the name of Roy Hartsfield. He wasn't my favorite guy. He wasn't my favorite manager because I never got into the lineup. So, uh, but I'm sure it had a lot to do with me because I was still learning and growing at that point in time. Awesome. Fiona, thank you so much for your question. Appreciate that. Uh, Jody, we'll send it down to you. Uh, say hello to Ernie. Good morning, Ernie. Thanks for doing this. Okay. Good morning, Joey. <laughs> Fiona, you took my question. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> of course, when we've got three catchers and catcher on, on the show, we're going to talk about catchers. So let's not talk about catchers. Um, Ernie, I would like to get um, your take on uh, the home run jacket, which is uh, a whole lot of fun, with these fun kids. 
You know, it, it's it's fun. I mean, it, it's you know the the major league baseball has come out with this let them play. So you know, I, I'm I'm fine. Let the kids. It's different than when I played in in the '80s, basically. Um, but I think like it's accepted. I know the Phillies; they have this uh, sombrero that they put on every time someone hits a home run. You know, since the Phillies are giving me a paycheck, I hope that they wear that thing constantly because if they're hitting home runs, we have a good chance that we're going to win. And we're battling for a playoff spot, as you know, right now. We're two games back of Atlanta. And, uh, you know, hopefully we will get in there some way. Um, again, I've been in the game a long time, and I still haven't gotten a World Series ring. So, you know, that's, that's my ultimate thing. If the Phillies get into the playoffs this year and they win it, and I get a World Series ring, I, I probably will retire. <laughs> <laughs> Jody, great, great uh, comeback by coming up with a new question on the fly. Got I love that. I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ernie, as a guy that played baseball in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and now is with an organization now and knows what a baseball looks like today, how much has the baseball changed with no sticky tack on it anymore? Or is it as rubbed down in mud as it used to be? All those kinds of things. As far as the the, the substance on the baseball, that, that's been happening quite a bit earlier on. Major League Baseball has now gone in and is checking the pitchers. Uh, if they do find anything, there's immediate ejection and suspension. Uh as far as when we played, there was we always felt that there were certain pitchers that were doctoring the ball, what we call doctoring the ball, applying a substance that makes the ball do crazy things, which makes it difficult to hit. Hitting a baseball is very difficult in the first place. But there's times when the you know the pitchers have complained that the ball is too slippery right now. And I I I kind of like the fact that they're they have some way of controlling it that they can feel the baseball in their hand because again the velocity it up if you get someone that's throwing 95 plus and he had can't feel the ball you know as a hitter you're very uncomfortable so the advantage goes that way but in a, then the other way if he does have the sticky substance i feel a little bit more confident as a hitter too because he can command the ball a little bit better so it, it's a Touch and feel, but I know that they, it's always been using rosin, you know, a little bit of pine tar, rosin, pine tar is not a little, but rosin is. They've used sunscreen and rosin to get more of a tacky feel. So, I, you know, it's something that's new this year, whether they will extend it into next year, I don't know. And then again, Major League Baseball is trying to do a lot of different things. They're trying a lot of different experiments in the minor leagues. You know, which some are good and some are bad. They've got the automatic ball strike thing going on in, in the Florida State League. Uh, we had some, you know, no shifts going on in double A. Everyone had to be on the dirt in the infield. Two throws over in our lower class A uh, affiliates. Uh, you can only throw over to the base twice. If you threw over the third time, you didn't pick them off. It was a balk. So, again, there's just certain things that MLB is trying to do to either enlighten the game, speed the game up, I don't know. Talking about, you know, changes that the MLB wants to implement, uh, probably first and foremost on a lot of Toronto fans after the series in Tampa would be the strike zone and would be, you know, potentially switching to an automated strike zone. Um, I don't know if you saw the Tampa series um, or, or any of those ninth inning calls in particular in the one game, but... Are we headed to a robo strike zone eventually? I think it's going to be difficult, but I wouldn't say never. Uh, there, there are some good things about it. I was, you know, I've seen a lot of our Florida State team games played. Uh, some of the downfalls is is there is a there is a hesitation, you know, be, before they can single the umpire whether it's a strike or ball. It does eliminate a lot of the arguments on whether it's balls or strikes. You know, the umpire will just throw up his hands says that's that's what our computer is telling us, that it is a strike. And, you know, then they're always yelling, well, you better check the computer. I don't know. But it's uh, one of the downfalls is if it's 3-2 and a base runner is running and you have that hesitation whether it's a strike or a ball, 
and you have to continue to throw the ball. But then again, if you throw it away and it's a ball four, that runner has the ability to advance not only to second, but also take third base. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that they need to speed up a little bit when it comes to balls and strikes. If they can do that, then it might be a good thing. But again, you know, I, I always like the human element of the umpires. I, for some reason, I enjoy talking to the umpires, not so much yelling at them, but talking to them <laughs> and trying to reason it out, you know, man to man. And, and you know, they want to get the play right. Then, you know, we're probably going to have to go to slow-mo replays and stuff like that. Other than the umpire, Ernie, you as a catcher have the best perspective of, of whether or not it's a ball or strike. How often... When you were squat down, you caught the ball. With, regardless of what the umpire is going to say, how often did you know 100% whether or not that ball was a ball or strike? I'm trying to just get to how hard this is for an umpire to call, or is it not as hard as maybe we think it is? No, it, it very it, it's it's very difficult. I mean, again, that ball is coming in over 90 miles an hour, and if it touches that outside line, you know, it's supposed to be a strike. Again, when I caught, we knew the umpires, we knew what zone they had, you know, some of the umpires would give us one or two inches off the plate on the outside, wouldn't give us anything on the inside. So again, that was all part of our game planning too. When we talked to our, you know, look, we're, we've got uh, uh, whoever behind the plate, we know exactly what his strike zone is. And so we can expand the strike zone on one side, but we can't expand it on the other side. Uh, now it's, it's very, you know, these, these umpires have gotten really, and it's amazing. You watch that strike zone a lot of times. I bet they get the right, the call right, probably 97, 98% of the time. I think their, their, their margin of error is like 94 or 95% of getting it right if I'm not mistaken. So guys are pretty good. It, it, it's, it's not an easy job and uh, a, a lot of work goes into it. I mean, that's why they spend time in the minor leagues too, to, to, to master their craft. Let's face it. When that box is on TV, it's exactly the same spot, whether the batter is six foot six or five foot four. Right. So, I mean, obviously there's going to be a change depending on the size of a hitter. Right. I mean, uh, you know, Aaron Judge's waist is not the same as Altuve's waist. That's his head, right? So that doesn't really show when they've got that box on television. Well, again, I think they, they would get rid of uh, People like the box, I think. But it causes a lot of grief from other people that are looking at it and say, well, that ball was in that zone or he hit the line. It should have been a strike. The umpire called it a ball. Oh, that umpire doesn't like us as a team. You know, it, it's, it's, it's supposed to go, as you said, there's different sizes that come up to the plate. So that zone also has to be different and it has to be created different. And I don't know whether it is or not. I, I, I really don't know the technology of that. All right. They've waited long enough. And I think you may know our next, uh, our next questions. And let's uh, begin with Sue. Say, say hello to Ernie. Hi, Ernie. Nice to see you. You look great. Thank you for doing this. And Thank you, uh, first, a comment. I loved what you said about having the information in your head because why can't these players these days learn this stuff and not need notes in their hats or on pieces of paper about what they're facing and who's doing what? So I love, I, I just think they should study a bit more, not have things written down. Anyway, Tom kind of uh, stole my question about the... the Come on, Tom. Tom. I'm sorry, robot. Tom. The, the robot. <laughs> I've, I've heard a lot about robot umps, and I I would love it because I get frustrated when when I see the box and the, the number of calls that are, are wrong. And it's for both teams, not just the Jays. It's for both. But um, there's been a reporter talking about robot umps and Pat Henkin the other day in Barry's... Uh, and Tom's out of the park uh, mentioned um, an umpire with a Bluetooth or something, some connection that they can get the calls right. Anyway, as an alternate question, Ernie, have you ever caught or been close to catching an immaculate inning? Yeah, I've caught a few. I, I, to be honest with you, I, 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 
and Maculina, you're talking about three strikeouts, nine pitches. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there, there, there's been a few. Uh, my gosh, I haven't caught in 30 years. So I, I, <laughs> to try to remember those, I, I don't, but I'm sure I had. I had some great pitchers that I was able to catch. And uh, so I, I would think over the years there was a few, but uh, I, 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 that's a good question. I, I, I wish I could answer it truthfully, but I really – don't know, but I think I have. You've, you've been on the receiving end of almost no hitters many times. Uh, well, especially if it's Dave Steed, do you talk to him? Do, like, does he, is he aware? Or, or for the most part, do guys know that they've got a no hitter going? All the players know. I mean, they, they you know, we, we really don't say anything. That's one thing that I, I, I guess is still true to form is that if the pitcher has a no hitter going, you know, we just let him go and do his thing, whatever his, his routine is after the end of the inning, you know, whether it's to go and get some Gatorade or water set, tile dry off and uh, just, leave them alone every now and then there'll be a conversation of okay this hitter's leading off the next again depending on the score of the game too you know there'll be constant conversation between the pitcher and the catcher on if there are any changes from the last time we faced this hitter three innings ago how are we gonna are we gonna keep the same approach i mean just normal baseball conversations that you would have but no, I mean, everyone knows. I mean, we, there's scoreboards all over the place. You can look up and you see it, that no hits. And and you get also get a feel because a pitcher, is, he's throwing a no hitter. He's got a, you know, he, he's he's throwing a lot of strikes. And, and the innings are rolling by pretty quick. All right, Sue, thank you. One to go. John, say hello to Ernie. Hello, John. As you're an official Canadian, so good day, eh? <laughs> good day, eh? <laughs> Ernie, you've you've been you've talked about a lot of other players and about the game, but I want to talk about Ernie Witt for a few minutes, and uh -oh. and I want to talk about your involvement in baseball. And I'm gonna I don't use this word lightly. It's been epic, and I'm gonna tell you why. You've been inducted into the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, and the people that you've been inducted with really. Um, mirror what a great uh, career you have had in your baseball uh, involvement over the years. So bear with me for a minute because I've got some notes here. So in 2009, Ernie, you were in... John always comes, comes prepared. prepared. John, John, why do you need notes? You should have it between the ears, man. <laughs> <laughs> Sue, <laughs> Sue, seal his notes right, right now. Take them. <laughs> it's not on my wrist, though. <laughs> so, so, Ernie, in 2009, you get inducted with Larry Walker, Bernie Soulier, who as well is, is involved with Baseball Canada, as, as you know, as everybody should know. And that is your career. And that's talking about your catching, your years of one year, I think you had the record for uh, pinch hit home runs. And then in 2012, you're the you're the coach of the uh, the senior men's baseball team with Baseball Canada. That year, you go in with Tom Hankey, Rusty Staub, Doug Melvin, um, who grew up in the same street as uh, Fergie Jenkins, Alan Simpson, Baseball America, Real Cormier. In 2018, hold on, here I'm going. 2018. Come on, John, we need to see your face. Which I've lost. Yes, yeah, sorry. 2018. Um, you go in as the coach of the Canadian uh, men's senior national team with Ray Carter, the president of Baseball Canada, Roy Halliday, Vladimir Guerrero. That's pretty heady company. And I know you're a very humble man, Murray, or, um, Ernie, and you're going to say, you know what? Those were the other people, yada, yada. I'm not going to buy that. This is Ernie Witt. This is Ernie Witt as a player. This is Ernie Witt as a coach. And I'm going to give you props for all of what you've done in baseball for um, the Jays and the other teams you played for and for the country of Canada with Baseball Canada. So I'm. Th that's just a sort of a talk. And um, 
I'm sure you've got a comment and I'm going to leave you to comment without a question. (laughs) All right. Well, first and foremost, John, thank you. That's uh, awfully nice words to say to me. Um, And you're, you're absolutely right. I will credit all the people around me. Um, (laughs) You know, I've been very fortunate to not only play the game that I love growing up, and I was able to make a nice career out of it. I mean, it, I, I've, I've been very fortunate with that. And then I've also been very fortunate in 1999, they asked me to manage the Canadian national team. And to this day, I look forward to every competition we go into and be a part of it. And uh, it's, it's, just, it's, it's just been a great life, it really has. Uh, but I've been around and associated with some great people and uh, good managers surround themselves with good baseball people and, and to have some people that have surrounded me, Greg Hamilton, Bernie Suye is just a gentleman that has been involved with baseball for a number of years. I was very honored to go in to the hall of fame, Canadian hall of fame with those gentlemen and, um, Players that I've played with, you know, you mentioned, you know, Tom Hankey, probably one of the classiest guys you'll ever find that that is just a tremendous human being, a tremendous pitcher, competitor, uh, you know, Doc Holliday. I mean, he, he was a tremendous competitor also. And I was very fortunate to, to coach him, not only when he came over with the Phillies, with the Blue Jays and, uh, uh, it was a sad loss when we when we lost him on that dreadful day uh, in that plane crash. But anyways, John, thank you so much for those kind words, and uh, it's 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 awfully nice to hear. Um, but again, I, I I credit a lot of it to the people that I I try to surround myself with. Great question, John and Sue Ernie. For someone as humble as you, do you remember what that feeling was like inside when the chance of Ernie, Ernie, Ernie started at Exhibition Stadium on a regular basis? Were you thrilled? Were you embarrassed? Were you humbled? Like, what was that feeling like? At first, I was probably embarrassed. You know, I mean, (laughs) not not so much embarrassed, humbled. I, I, I don't know, but Gosh, I did enjoy it. That's for sure. And it, it did, uh, you know, it did pick me up and make me made me focus maybe a little bit more. I, and I think a few times I've been told that I hit home runs when they were chanting. And I'm sure there's a few times I struck out when they were chanting, but, <laughs> but uh, it never changed to booze. So, I mean, that's that's the one thing. And, and, and the fact that I feel good about my career is that after every game, I could look in the mirror and say, I gave it my best, you know, and I I think, and I said that to, and I say that to players today when I'm coaching them, just give everything you got today. Look in the mirror. If you say you did that, you've had a good day. Tomorrow's a new day. Let's give, let's move on to tomorrow. I think truer words could not have been spoken, not just with baseball, with the world we're living in right now. Uh, Ernie, Thank you so much for taking the time. This has been a lot of fun. We really do enjoy it. Uh, All the best in Philadelphia. Uh, Wouldn't it be nice to see a uh, repeat of the 1992 World Series? That would be great, but I have to be honest with you. I'd be pulling for the (laughs) Phillies. Yeah, I'm sure you would. (laughs) All right, forget about that. Ernie, thanks so much. Stay well, and we'll talk to you again soon, okay? Thank you to all of you. There is former Toronto Blue Jay and manager... Uh, who's, you know, managed Team Canada and been just a huge part of Baseball Canada, Mr. Ernie Witt. Wow, Tom, just, again, a a really great open conversation. And this is what I love about doing Out of the Park with you each and every week is we just get these really raw conversations with these former Blue Jays. And, And as I say, every single week, not only are they open and not only are they honest, but they're unbelievably well spoken every single one of them you know the stories that they tell they're so engaging the pictures that they paint of the experiences they've had it's you know this was a really special one with ernie he's been such an inspirational figure to baseball in canada and yes. for everybody that's ever eaten a mother's pizza back in the day mm-hmm. restaurant goers too that's right 
Uh, and if you're watching for the first time, well, first of all, thank you. And please subscribe. Hit the subscribe button you see here on YouTube. Uh, and if you're listening for the first time as well, uh, you'll notice at the end of the show, we bring in some of our out-of-the-park insiders. And they get a chance to engage with the player. And how cool is that to sit in with, for some, your favorite player? But shockingly, of our insiders, there's only three or four that do this on a regular basis. So mm -hmm. you have a great opportunity, if you are not an insider, to become an insider and get involved in our next Zoom. Tom, how do they do that? Patreon.com slash out of the park. $3 a month, $5 a month. Join us in these talks. Have an awesome time. You know what? Send us a DM. Uh, we'll let you know what players we're looking at down the road. You know, you don't even have to commit until you hear about a really good player. But I promise you, it's well worth it. These talks are amazing. Yes. Uh, Tom, I was really looking forward to not seeing you this weekend, but I just realized that uh, I think I may have stolen a few things of yours the last time I was with you, uh, uh, including a couple of guitars. So, um, you know what? I'm not going to give them back. It's September. Why would I give them back? Tom, thank you as always, and thanks to all of you for making us a part of your week.